This is the Fertility Friday podcast, episode number 91. Today's episode is brought to you by my new Fertility Boost group program. My group program includes six to eight women who are also looking for a deeper understanding of fertility awareness and wanting to improve their cycles naturally. If you're listening to this episode during the month of August in 2016, make sure to head over to fertilityfriday.com slash programs for more information and to reserve your spot. If you're listening to this episode after August of 2016, then head over to fertilityfriday.com slash programs to find out when the next group program is starting and how to get on the wait list. Welcome to the 91st episode of the Fertility Friday podcast. Thank you for joining me today. I'm Lisa from fertilityfriday.com and this is your source for information about the fertility awareness method and all things fertility. I started this podcast because I believe that every woman has the right to know exactly how her body and her fertility works. I'm here to connect you with the tools and information that you need to improve your menstrual cycle health and fertility. And I feel so privileged to be able to share my passion for body literacy and fertility awareness with you every single week. Fertility awareness is so much more than just birth control or trying to get pregnant because it truly gives you a window into your own health and fertility. And I love sharing my expertise with my clients and helping them to understand their charts and connect with their cycles. If you've recently discovered fertility awareness, but you're not feeling confident about using it for birth control just yet, or you've been charting for a while and you're having trouble making sense of what's happening in your cycle, I can help. Get started today with a free 15-minute consultation with me by heading over to fertilityfriday.com coaching, or just click the work with me button on my website. And I would also like to invite you to sign up for the Fertility Friday newsletter. Head over to fertilityfriday.com ebook. And as a gift to you, you'll receive a free copy of my new ebook where I reveal what to expect when coming off of hormonal contraceptives, and I share five steps to restoring healthy menstrual cycles post-pill. And in today's show, I'm very excited to welcome my guests, Kelsey Knight and Emily Varnum to the show. Emily is a trained birth and postpartum doula, midwife assistant, birth control doula, placenta encapsulation specialist, and she holds a degree in counseling and mentoring. She's been working with newborns and families since the age of seven, which I should probably ask about later. And her, <laughs> her goal is to be able to take women's hands during puberty and walk them through every stage of reproductive health. She's also been tracking her cycle for the past three years. And Kelsey is a labor and delivery registered nurse in New York City. She pursued a nursing career in inpatient obstetrics and is certified as a lactation counselor and childbirth educator. She's also interested in documenting women's stories. She completed a 12-week certification in filmmaking, so I'm sure we'll see some interesting things from Kelsey in the future. But in today's episode, we're actually going to be talking about their recent trip across the U.S. Kelsey and Emily just took a three-month tour of the States where they offered free reproductive health classes to over 60 locations. And they funded their trip through a successful Kickstarter campaign, which is just awesome. So I can't wait to hear more about the trip and the inspiration behind it. So welcome, ladies. Welcome to the show. Hi. Thank you so much. Thank you for having us here. Well, thank you for being here. So I'd, I'd just like to give each of you an opportunity to introduce yourself to the audience. So uh, maybe, Emily, let's start with you. I'm Emily, and all that stuff is true. <laughs> I was kind of wondering what I wrote four or five months ago, but it's all still true. But now I'm focusing more on the reproductive health education part of my work. So that's kind of what I'm doing more now is just giving people the information and trusting them that they can do it and and kind of supporting them through that, which is really great. I'm writing a book about the trip and I'm also planning to move in the next two months to Detroit. Okay. So lots of things are happening for me. And yeah, I'm really excited about continuing the project. We've been doing panel discussions also, and we have some other things planned for the project. So we're, we're pretty excited to continue the work that we started. Mm-hmm. Um, and Kelsey, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah. Hi, thanks for having me. I am still a registered nurse in New York. I still am interested in being on the clinical side of things. And I just got my IBCLC certification, which is really exciting. So I hope to um, to pursue that work in New York as well. And, and still super excited to see what's in the future for the fifth vital sign and continue this really important reproductive health work. And I don't know what that is. Sorry to interrupt. IBLC? Yeah, the International Board Certified Lactation Consultant. Okay. Very proud. We're very proud. <laughs> mm-hmm. That's amazing. <laughs> Thank you. 
Can I just add a little story to that? That Kelsey took that exam in the middle of the trip. She, we didn't know the exact time, so she ended up having to. We ended up having to just get up one morning and leave. And she studied like in the car, and she passed with like I think a pretty high result. And it's a not a very easy <laughs> exam. And I just need to take this opportunity to say that she did a really good job to everybody because I got to open the thing and I was crying because I'm so <laughs> proud of what of her for doing so. That's, you just have to add that bit in. <laughs> that's really <laughs> impressive. I am impressed yeah. that you did it Thank while on the trip. That's dedication right there. <laughs> Thank you both so much. That's Kelsey Knight. That's Kelsey Knight in one action. <laughs> no. Okay. Well, I want to hear about the trip, but one of the things that I didn't mention is uh, your website, the fifthvitalsign.com. So before we get into the trip, I want to hear about the fifthvitalsign.com, how it came about and what your goals are for the work that you're doing. The website really we made um, in conjunction with the trip and our hope for the website is that it will be a resource for education to kind of continue the work that we began to do. We, we kind of went around and planted seeds in person because I think that that's the best way to really, you know, reach people and for them to be able to learn and for them to be able to connect. But what we're actually working on doing now is putting all of our resources on there so that people can actually keep learning and keep continuing what we started via the website. Okay. That's what our hope is. And Kelsey built the website, by the way. Oh, well, Kelsey, that's, yeah, it's a lovely website. I really, yeah, you've got all kinds of talents in the digital media area. Oh, <laughs> she's also a lawyer. No, I'm joking. <laughs> and she's an accountant and she <laughs> yeah. is also a medical doctor. Watch her juggle. <laughs> yeah, it, it is really our hope that it will become more of a resource and we'll have a list of our recommendations and hope to make like a map for abdominal massage therapists throughout the United States and yes. to have our class information on there. So definitely be on the lookout in the next couple months for some changes. And I always like to say our website is five TH vital sign. That's the weird thing about having our name be the fifth vital sign. You always have to specify if it's, you know, letters or numbers, but. Mm -hmm. Well, and it caught my attention of course, because one of the things I talk about a lot on the podcast is how a woman's menstrual cycle is considered by many health professionals as the fifth vital sign of a woman's health, meaning that if it's not normal, if if your menstrual cycle is not within the normal healthy parameters, then that is your body's way of telling you that something's off. So what inspired you then specifically to call it that? Is it related to that exact thing? It was really... Um... That the ACOG recommendation that it could be a vital sign. And I just read that. And then I was teaching a very different version of this class and it was called My Vagina, My Business. But I think that there are going to be people who menstruate who don't even relate with the idea of having a vagina, right? So I really wanted to make, we really wanted it to be gender neutral. We really wanted it to be something that we could like write on a notice board at a university and people wouldn't be like, whoa. Or we could teach at a church. <laughs> so the fifth vital sign worked because it's true and it's relevant and it makes sense in the context of what we're doing. But it also is non-assuming, you know, in that way. Like it's not going to really alienate anybody. And what we really, are, you know, the number one goal in anything is just to do no harm. You know, if you're, if you're going out there trying to support people, that should be your number one goal. So we really wanted to kind of have a name that could just be written anywhere. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Not that you can't write vagina anywhere, but it just like, we thought we might face some problems. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that makes sense. So now I want to switch gears and talk about the trip. First of all, I want to know what inspired you to get on the road, uh, even to have, where did the idea come from in the first place? I guess we could start there to, to travel across the States to deliver this education in person. I think we both came to it like a little bit differently. I had been, as I said, I'd been teaching those classes and we really wanted to do something during that like really intense part of winter. <laughs> we really like both really needed like kind of a little bit of a change and some inspiration. And I've been teaching those classes and we talked about maybe doing like childbirth ed on the road. And then one day I was just, I just cause was kind of like, it's called the fifth vital sign. And then we and I kind of had an idea of the logo, which is our logo still. And it's like on our website and it's us doing like basically checking your pulse um, but on your uterus. And it's like the fifth vital sign. You know how you check your other vital sign, your pulse, mm -hmm. um, or one of your other vital signs. So it was kind of like, okay, we need this inspiration. And I asked Kelsey, I was like, 
would you be interested in doing this thing? I didn't really know what it was and, and it only became what it is because both of us collaborated together. I was like, let's do a trip and teach this kind of this class on this topic. And then Kelsey went away to her parents and came back and was like, yes, I'm going to do it because she's an amazing friend. She was like, yep, I'm going to do it. She just jumped on board and, and has been like that on board ever since and, and just brought kind of everything that it is now. I think too, at the time we were living together. And so we were, you know, getting to have these interesting conversations in our apartment. And Emily was the first one who sort of named this idea for me. And it really rung true for me. We both came to this idea from our background in childbirth and, and Emily and I kind of discussed the idea of meeting your cervix for the first time in labor. Um, you know, people might've known like intellectually that they had a cervix, but they were sort of realized it was in their body and doing something in labor. And we, and, and we knew this conversation needed to happen a lot earlier. And the more Emily spoke to me about what she was reading and about, and I went to my vagina, my business, it just seemed so incredibly important. I think it made sense in what we were both doing. Like it just, it was contextualized in our lives immediately. Like people were already coming over and asking me questions about this stuff. And at a, like a really high rate, like people were not almost like knocking our door down and being like, Hey, help me with this. And then I became, I started doing this birth control doula work and we, we just were like, okay, people need this. Let's give it to them. We have a podcast too called Hail to the V and we had the opportunity. Emily got to interview Holly Griggs ball, which, and I know you've interviewed her too. And, and she's fantastic. And, um, you know, her book was such an inspiration to us. So I think that was really huge. Um, yeah, that was huge for us too. Well, and so now I want to hear a breakdown of what you teach. And so what exactly were you teaching in the classes that you did as you were traveling across the States? Yeah. So we traveled for three months. We went to 43 States. We drove 15,000 miles and the class was really influenced by who we were meeting and the questions we were getting. And we learned so much from our participants. It was such a collaborative process, but Overall, the class started out, we would talk about uh, the phenotypically female reproductive system. We, we just, you know, Emily does such a good job of, of introducing the classes and she always prefaces it by saying that we don't want to make any assumptions because we think this is how we got here. And she, she uses this <laughs> great line about how you ask someone their name the first time you meet them. And then if you forget their name and like two weeks later, you're still hanging out, it's embarrassing to ask for their name again. It's uncomfortable. And that's kind of where we are with reproductive health in some ways. Like some people feel or society makes us feel like we're too old to ask certain questions. And so we, we just wanted to create this space where people were comfortable asking questions and where we weren't making any assumptions. So that's where we start. And then Emily does a great job of talking about the menstrual cycle. She goes into fertility awareness. And then we talk about breast awareness informed choice, uh, especially in regards to hormonal and non-hormonal birth control. Um, and then we talk about uh, menstrual care products and go into some diet and lifestyle stuff. So it's only two hours. I know that feels, <laughs> that feels like a lot of stuff to cover. Um, and of course, we could, go, we could have a two-hour class for each one of those topics. But you know, I think we did a good job of, of doing an overview. And our hope was that everyone left the classes feeling that their bodies has worth. Yeah. And I'll just add, like in our kind of diet and lifestyle stuff at the end, I think that's often where people really, it really brings it all together and where people really kind of start to think about like who's in that area and connecting to a community. So we really try to just kind of like be people coming in from the outside and sort of reminding people you're reminding people and laying a foundation of, of what's what's true, like the menstrual cycle, breast health, things like that. But then kind of really inviting them to go deeper with it and go further with it. And also to ask for more. We talk a lot about this idea that, you know, I talk about my personal experience being in a lot of pain as a menstruating person and, and how if I'd had that pain anywhere else, somebody would have probably taken me to a hospital because it was such a high level of pain. And so we kind of talk about, well, you know, it, should we accept that? And if not, what should we do about it? And we talk, we introduce people to things that they could do. So it's really informational, but it's also kind of like, we're here for you and, and let's figure this out together and then look around the room and, and that's your community too. So it was really great to teach. Mm -hmm. I feel like taking a little, just a quick detour to uh, touch on what you just said, which is that if the pain was anywhere else in your body, 
someone would do something about it. <laughs> and mm-hmm. I, I recently read an article and it said that menstrual pain has finally been acknowledged, apparently by men, because women already know this, that it's as severe as a heart attack. And mm-hmm. it's like, when are we going to take it seriously? I think, I don't know if you've had the experience, because uh, you, you, know, you mentioned that you've had painful periods, but like if you're partnered... And then mm-hmm. like all, like your partner <laughs> sees you when you're, you know, having like your worst menstrual pain. I distinctly remember like my partner, my like partners over the years or, you know, just I'd be doubled over in pain on the floor and like really just completely incapacitated. And he'd just be like, uh, I don't know what to do here and like try to touch you. And you're just like, don't touch me. I, I don't particularly like to, like I don't particularly like to be touched when I'm in like a lot of pain because it's like you're not helping, you're not making it worse. It's just just get off, like you know what I mean. Just don't touch me. And so, I don't know. Do you need to have that experience to get how bad it is? Because could you imagine if you like walked into your like you have a, a, a guy friend or whatever, and he's like on the floor, like doubled over in pain, and it um, happens every month. Yeah, I, that, that's, it's been a really good opportunity, I guess, because I'm a doula, like what helped me with my cycles when I started working with women in labor was that, first of all, I use all the same techniques, like I will hypnobirth, um, <laughs> I will do all those different things to help myself, I'll just be in the shower a lot, um, but also it helped me to train the people around me to to give me the help that I needed, so I needed like I know specific physical things that help me during then. And I kind of know like how long it's going to last for, like how many days. Um, and, and it is a lot of pain. Like not only will I be like doubled over, but I'll like cry. Mm-hmm. And I kind of like the people that are going to be there, I've been able to train them. And I just hope I'm sending out like through my dating <laughs> life. I hope I'm sending out men who just know more and are better at supporting <laughs> through that experience. <laughs> I really hope my pain is benefiting other women. No. Um, <laughs> I, I do think it's important to for people to be able to understand that and I think I kind of see them the same as I sometimes see people at births where they're like I don't know yeah and that also helps me to be like okay what do I need to do and teach a dad so that he feels like he does know or that he feels like he does have a place so yeah I think it's kind of what we're really going towards with this is that we need to be in this together. We need to make change. We're not at a place where we can accept where we're at anymore. And and I think we're, we're doing a good job of beginning to do that and beginning to uncover where that change needs to happen. And we want to keep inviting everybody to the conversation. And, um, you know, we were doing that in lots of different ways. Sometimes I would even just be on Tinder and be like, hey, let me just see if somebody wants to come to a class. And we, it's, we really want to just have men be involved in the conversation because I think that's how we kind of also remove shame from this conversation. And then that's how we get more access to resources and more help. Yeah, well, absolutely. And I don't want to imply that my male partners weren't supportive. It was more oh, kind okay. of getting at the like sheer intensity of the mm-hmm. actual pain being so intense that your partner is left feeling like, oh, my God. What can I do for her? Because it's so intense. And the fact that that can be ignored by, like, generally by our system. So that's like a tangent. But one of the things I wanted to pull back to is how you just casually dropped in the conversation that you went through 43 states and traveled 15,000 miles. You just dropped that as if it was like, (laughs) and I went to the movies. (laughs) Yeah, it was casual. It's only just hitting us now, I think. Like oh, yesterday, you know, I was like, we spent states. every day together for three months. <laughs> well, so let's talk a little bit more about what that was like. I mean, I have a logistics question. You know, how did you set up 60 different locations and, you know, how did you kind of map it out? Like, let's talk a little bit about that because I'm curious. Yeah, um, it, it came together fairly quickly. We we were so fortunate to have a successful Kickstarter and we also had a generous donation from an organization called Informed Choice for America, which really helped us. And we bought this huge map off Amazon and put it up in Emily's <laughs> room. And one night after I worked, and I'm sure Emily worked that night too, we put up just pins in places that you know, we had people contact us through the Kickstarter. That was kind of a great way to get the word out. And we asked people like, please, if you want us to come invite us. And, and so many people kind of responded to that call and and showed up for us when we needed them. And so we put pins in those places and then we put pins in other places that, you know, we had read about or were interested in. And we, um, 
put a piece of yarn between all those places and, and made this map and bought a car. We bought a used car with, with the money <laughs> that was so generously donated from us, uh, to, to us. And yeah. And then, and then we hit the road. I think it was March 2nd. Um, we really, it was really a quick time frame, like two months before we left, I was like, this is the name. And then we, Kelsey was like, I'm let's do it. And then we did the 28 day Kickstarter, which finished like 10 days before the end. We fulfilled it and we went over and then we just were like, okay, well, guess we should probably do it then. Cause everybody's, and we were overwhelmed. I mean, every time somebody would donate, I would be like, Oh my God, Kelsey, <laughs> someone else has donated. Like I just did not conceptualize. And I feel stupid now. Like how insanely well and like just amazingly people responded and positively I just had no concept of that and like to the level that it was like throughout the whole trip it we say that this trip was powered by the kindness of strangers because of of just how much help and support we had along the way it was really through and through like the biggest most amazing collaboration that I've ever been able to be part of and I, I and maybe ever will be you know it's, it was like it was really really that special from the funding to like where we stayed you know I think the positive response too I mean we just we got the most incredible responses and it's a reflection of how ready people are for this information I'm, I'm sure you've experienced the same thing Lisa with your podcast and with your work and yeah we just I mean kept asking people to show up and they did it was incredible Emily we we're having a little pre-chat while Kelsey was getting set up on the call and you had talked a little bit about just the kindness of people. And we had talked a little bit just about how I think that it's easy to forget in our crazy world, especially if you watch the news on a regular basis and kind of get sucked in all the murder and mayhem. I mean, it's important to know what's happening, but I think it's hard when you inundate yourself with that to remember that there's so much kindness and love out there. Yeah. And so I'd love for you just to talk a little bit more about your experience. Uh, even how you said that people open up their homes to you. That's just such a wonderful that thing. That was so special. I mean, I had no concept of this country, honestly. I was like living in New York, had only been to a couple of other states and just had no idea of America. I'm not even from here. Obviously, you can maybe tell by my accent that's still partly there um, <laughs> that I'm from England. And I think we were just both so moved by how freely and openly people invited us into their homes, how freely they invited us into their families and into their experiences. It wasn't so much the sharing of physical things. It was that people were really ready to be in a space with us. And I think that that really, and, and across the board, like every single state we, that happened to us. And one of the biggest things that happened and the biggest, I like to think of it as like the opportunity that we had in the middle of the trip to recommit to the work was that we were robbed in San Francisco. Our car windows were smashed. Two of the windows were smashed and everything was taken. And in that moment, we asked for help. We asked our community and they gave it to us. Like we got $3,000 on GoFundMe in a day to replace the windows and to, to fix the car and to carry on. And and everywhere we went, people were like, like, I was wearing the one outfit that I was left with because all my stuff was taken and I was crossing the street and somebody pulled their car over and was like, I love your outfit. And nobody had ever said that about that outfit before. And it was just felt so meaningful because it was the only thing I had. And then we went into a coffee shop and this woman came out from behind the counter and like hugged us. And everybody was just like, oh my goodness. And I just was like, this collective, like, just taking us in and holding us was so incredible. And I just hope so much. I learned so much about what I want to give to the world by what we were able to receive and, and also about how to receive. Like in that moment, I was just like, the only thing we have left to do because we so much want to continue this work is to ask our community and to ask for help. And that was like what we did. And then we received it. We were like, thank you. This is what we need to be able to continue the work. And we did. And we drove through the night and we arrived at this place where we were able to give like the next talk and it just went so seamlessly and we both kind of like looked at each other and we were like okay that was all our stuff but guess what we don't need it we have each other we have the information this will not stop us wow that's so powerful on a totally unrelated note can I ask about the background noise because the listeners are yeah. going to hear it so maybe tell us where you are <laughs> uh, yeah yeah um, so just before we left for tour, I helped my friend, who's also a doula, have her third baby on her couch. She had had two C-sections and she was like, I'm going to go for a V-back. And I, I had a dream about it and that she had an unassisted birth, which did not happen in real life. But so I attended her third birth and now I live with them. I live with that family. And so those are her three beautiful children. 
who I get to play with uh-huh. <laughs> every day. Yeah, it's amazing. So after living with all these families, I could not go back to not being in a community. I was raised in a commune and I just need to be in a family. Like that's where I need to be in a big, expensive community where we're all supporting and love e- loving each other. And that's like how I've chosen to live my life now. That's what I want to do forever. <laughs> And yeah. for the listeners who might not be super familiar with all the birth terminology, so VBAC is a word VBAC for if a, if a woman has had C-section, um, if she wants to deliver vaginally afterwards, it's vaginal birth after C-section, just yeah. in case some of the listeners are not familiar with that terminology. So let's talk a little bit about how your work was received. I'm still wrapping my head around, <laughs> you know, I've done a lot of talks in my life, but you know, like I had a job where I was I was doing sexual assault awareness education, and we would go into schools and do five, you know, presentations in a day, like for the different classes. And so I've been to lots of junior high schools, and I've done lots of talks for women and different things. But 60 in three <laughs> months? No, to 60 different locations, <laughs> uh, to 60 different groups? No, I can't say that I have ever done anything like that. So I want to hear more about that. What was that like and how were you received? Yeah, so doulas are great networkers and and they were just so instrumental during our trip. And we had people reach out to us through Facebook or or in certain cities. We, We initiated contact with certain organizations that we thought might be open to hosting us. And in most cases, people, you know, we would have like a, a point person in each location and they would invite their community and their friends to the event. And yeah, we just, we kind of just walked in with open arms and, you know, sometimes there'd be two people in a class. One time we, we walked into this incredible homestead center in Mississippi and there were like 80 people in the oh, room. Goodness. And, you know, sometimes we had an idea that would happen because we, we used Facebook events. And so we might have, you know, an RSVP list, but we kind of just had to be incredibly flexible and prepared for anything. And, and the response was, was so, so positive. I mean, just so much gratitude from people who were there and we got so much from the people who were there as well. Was there one kind of comment that you got the most or one piece of feedback that you kept hearing over and over again? Just like, I wish I had this when I was 12. And that's kind of why we did it. We're like, we're doing the class that we wish we had when we were 12 years old or 11 years old. It was all like, Oh, I wish I'd known this. Oh, I wish somebody had told me that. Oh. And now when I look at kids, I'm like, don't worry when you're this age, we'll figure it out for you. (laughs) That's like my motivation. Now I see a baby be born and I'm like, don't worry. I got you. (laughs) <laughs> and we did have some 12 year olds in the class we did. and we did, we even did a whole day of eighth grade science at a public school in Portland. Mm. Like sex, sex ed. That's really incredible. I think one of the things that I've been contemplating now, so as I told you at the beginning, you know, this is episode number 90 and yeah. I've had so many positive responses from my listeners and I think one of the responses that's the hardest is from women who are around that age 40, 41, who write me and they just feel so upset and so frustrated that they're finding this information now because it's often when they are struggling with infertility that they are seeking Mm -hmm. information about fertility and pregnancy. And that's when they're finding the podcast. And I always feel bad in the sense that you know, I'm not trying to make people feel bad. Yeah. Right. So, you know, you know what I'm saying? I, I just feel yes. like, how do you balance that? The joy of, of finally learning it with the, the grief associated with not having known it at t- age 20. I mean, you can't go back and reorganize your life with the knowledge that you didn't have. I don't know. How would you address that, that I sentiment? Think, so, the way that I see birth is that it is very scientific. It does have this informational layer, but it also has this layer of magic, this, this like impossible layer to really quantify. And I see reproductive health like that all the time. You know, it is formulaic. It does have these certain things, but it's also like that's just, you know, it just has this magical quality. And I talk to people about that. And I talk to people about that because what I want them to do is to be able to bring their feelings there with them. And I want us also to understand that if a 20-week fetus has all of its eggs and you're inside of your grandmother, that a lot of this stuff comes down emotionally in your cells, you know? So 
I think one of the ways that we address it is just, and one of the ways we hope to address it further with some of our upcoming projects is that really just acknowledging that emotional layer and giving that space, you know, that, that actually there is realities that are in your body that are specific to your body, but that, um, that we can kind of the space for us to hear them and, and be with them and support them, whatever, and meet people wherever they are, because I think that is a really frustrating place to be. And what makes it more frustrating is that we don't really give space sometimes for us to be angry about stuff like that or be sad about stuff like that or be confused about stuff like that. And I think that's where we can meet people in that space is just to be like, those feelings are okay. It does suck that you weren't given that information. We often don't give women a right to be angry about stuff just in general it's like not an emotion that we we really like give permission for sometimes and I think that that's like hugely important so we're planning to do we do this panel events called conversations with our bodies because we think that fertility awareness method is this skilled form of listening and the way you live in your body is the way that you respond to that and what we'd like to do is actually do retreats where we hold space for people to learn but also to kind of process their stories because everybody has a different story and those stories are important and medicinal, as you know, from having a podcast for everybody else too, and, and medicinal to tell for the person sharing. So I think that one of the ways to address that is, yeah, just really that. And it's maybe because I'm a, like a counseling therapist and come from that background too, but I think it's really to kind of like give space to it, to really support it and, and be there as in a kind of a, almost a doula capacity to let that play out and to let that person own that. I think too, Emily, that that was kind of part of your hope for the birth control doula yeah. idea. Well, could you tell us what a birth control doula is? Yes. Um, so a birth control doula is somebody who gives you the same kind of support as a doula in that we are there in a non-judgmental way just for the person who has enlisted our services. And what it is, is somebody who supports you in your reproductive health care needs, it can be before a baby. So that's like what, how it's different to sort of like a birth doula or a doula associated with pregnancy or when you're not even planning a pregnancy. And it's for choosing a method of birth control that works for you, which can be whatever you feel works best for you. So I'm, I'm not going to kind of influence people. But it's partly the education, so like laying out options, partly pulling together of resources in your community. So seeing what your history has been, seeing what some of your areas that you feel are challenging. So maybe if somebody has menstrual cramps, I'm going to you know, talk to them about like an herbalist or a, a, my abdominal massage therapist or any form of abdominal massage therapist, I should say. Maybe I'm going to just kind of talk them through like, okay, when you feel these things, who are your support people? Like, what are your resources? A lot of it is just kind of coaching in that way. To, and some of it is also just holding space to give people permission to put some of their energy into feeling good in their body. And honestly, I think a lot of it is just that. And then it's also somebody who you can call on because I'm used to being on call. If you do have these like really insane cramps, because a lot of that is the same as labor support. You know, so if you do need somebody to come over and be with you or you do need somebody to come and push on your back, because that's honestly what I need is somebody to actually like do counter pressure on my back. So it's kind of all of those things. And, and what I hope is actually with the retreat and, and ongoing is actually just train so many people in their communities to be able to do this stuff, to be able to kind of like listen for it and watch for it and, and be there as support for each other, because I just don't think we can have enough support, especially for feeling good in our bodies, because it's such a barrier to life if you feel uncomfortable and in pain. I missed so much of my education because of it. And Kelsey, were you going to jump in there? Oh, I was going to say that Emily mentioned too the idea of non-judgment that I think is a really important part of the doula philosophy that we tried hard to incorporate into our own curriculum and just kind of into our own beings. But um, that was a huge part of our class. We were we were not there to tell anyone what was best for them because we because only you know what's best for you. We were just there to provide information that was as unbiased as possible so that people could make the best decisions for their bodies. This is something that uh, Emily and I were also talking about in our little pre-chat while Kelsey were getting set up. And it was kind of educating your potential clients on what it is that you actually do. Because I think what you said was you, you don't have to tell anybody what a lawyer does. We all know what they do. But how do you convey what we do. And that's something that I find too in my growing practice with clients to really kind of get your head around what it is that, that you actually do. Because when you're working with a woman and you're teaching fertility awareness, it goes so much deeper than teaching fertility awareness. Because I've yet to work with a client with a very straightforward, easy, breezy, no issue cycle. 
And so you just end up delving in so much deeper and there's so many layers. So why don't you talk a little bit about what your experience was like educating kind of the masses on not only the information, but also what you do? Yeah, I think we always tried to leave space for the emotional. And if anything ever came up during a class, we would take as many minutes as were necessary to sort of address what someone was experiencing or what the group was feeling. I think in terms of educating, you know, what I was saying was that, for example, being a doula, the first thing you have to do is explain what a doula is. And I think a lot of times, you know, especially when we were kind of just out there, like, walk into a restaurant or we'd walk into a store and we'd be like, we're on a reproductive health tour of America. And then people would be like, okay, just unpack that for me for a second. And then there were always these educational opportunities. And I think we both were able to kind of see those and take those as whenever we could. And in terms of the classes, I think there was a lot of terminology that we'd have to explain, but we really tried to sort of simplify it as much as possible. And then I think the key was really in the introduction those little lighthearted stories or lines that we used every time that were really just like inviting people to ask questions. And in the beginning, we got people saying like, this might be a stupid question. But, you know, later we started to be like, well, actually, there are no stupid questions. And and people kind of like moved away from that a little bit and just asked their questions, which was awesome. So it was kind of a lot of explaining in a way, but we sort of also trust people if we've given them enough like warm up that they will give us questions. And we tried to give like lots of different ways to ask questions. Like we kept kind of, you know, reminding people, you can also email us or you can also contact us separately. And, and I just felt like giving everybody my phone number and being like, just be my friend. Um, (laughs) Just, just be my best friend. So we, we really just kind of, yeah, we invited questions. We invited um, that openness of dialogue and, and in that way we were able to explain all of the things that that were confusing to people. And, because it was strangers walking in, so we had no idea of what they already knew. And some, t- some groups knew more and some groups needed more information from us. And, and some groups just taught us everything. And we were like, why don't you teach the class? <laughs> <laughs> I think too, um, and I'm sure you've experienced this, it can kind of take a while for some information to, to sink in. And our classes were really dense. We were talking about a lot of sort of complicated things in two hours. And so some people did follow up with us, which was really great. Yeah. And we want to keep traveling. We want to get back out there. I'm, as I said, moving to Detroit in a couple of months. And um, we're going to be doing a class there in August. Actually, August 9th, we're going to be doing a class in Detroit. And we have another class here in in New York on the 30th of July. So we are doing a lot more classes. We're going to keep doing more classes. And if people want us to come, you should invite us. Like We still want to come. Yeah, (laughs) we should set something up in Toronto. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we'll have to follow up on that because that would be a lot of fun. And so what did you learn from this educational experience that you had that you weren't expecting to learn? Something that surprised you? That's a lot. That's always such a good question. (laughs) I think, oh, go ahead. I was surprised by what was available in each state. I knew intellectually that we were kind of in a, a strange stage at the moment with reproductive health care provision, but I was shocked when I saw its effects. I was shocked when I saw that, like, for example, there are only two midwives in the whole of Alabama. I was shocked that there's one abortion clinic in Mississippi. I was shocked at how hard it would it was to access information. People drove like four or five hours sometimes to see the class and and that shocked me too. That, that just for information, like one day we were sending out mail from a post office and the guy was like, is there anything you know dangerous in here? And I was like, just information. Hmm. And then I was like, well, actually, like we are kind of labeling information as dangerous at the moment. We're labeling this empowerment of the body as, as dangerous and something we should be pushing back against. And that just feels so wrong to me. So I think that cons- like really embodying that knowledge and understanding of what's happening for people, for, for like our brothers and sisters in this country is, is always really huge. And, and yeah, there were places where it felt more about access to healthcare based on like what your postcode is. It was sometimes more based on like how much money you earn. It was sometimes based more on like the body you were born into, but it was always like, I was always just seeing this like barriers. And I guess that was like a big lesson and seeing that and just seeing like, okay, we really need to do something. We need to pull together. So the state of Mississippi has one abortion clinic. Mm-hmm. We volunteered there. I'm still there. Like I'm still. I know. Past. <laughs> I know. Because I just Wikipedia 
the state of Mississippi, and I don't understand that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so access issues, yeah that that would be huge. I, I'm Canadian, so yeah. recently I I understood and learned. So you know, my U.S. listeners, please forgive me because I didn't know. But here in Canada, if you work a certain number of hours, you are legally entitled to maternity leave, meaning that your employer has to hold your job and you will get a certain percentage of your salary from employment insurance, which is a government program that, so it depends on how much you pay into it. It depends on how much you make at your job, but you will still get a certain percentage of your salary up to a maximum level for a year, like 12 months. Mm-hmm. And then your employer is required to hold your job. Now, obviously, like, you know, it doesn't, it's always not always so super straightforward, but just as a Canadian woman who is work, like who's employed, you have that expectation. Like it's an expectation among Canadian women that you have this time. Not everybody can afford to take a year because you're not, like if you say you have a salary, you make lots of money, you're not going to get the same amount. <laughs> So some women can't afford to take a year, but you have Mm -hmm. that option. And to find out that in the States, there is nothing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we're like one of, and I'm so sorry if this is inaccurate. We're something like one of two countries possibly in the whole world besides Papua New Guinea that doesn't have paid maternity leave options. So it's pretty wild. There's still so much, so much work to do. And the option is like 12 weeks unpaid for some women. Yeah, exactly. It's I know people crazy. at my work would just save up their sick time. So, because. yeah, it's it's really, yeah, the, the access piece, that's a whole, like, I feel like I could just rant for two hours about that. <laughs> I don't know if anyone would be interested in hearing that rant, (laughs) but (laughs) because I mean, I would go deep with that. Well, I'm again, another tangent, but I mean, the States is suffering. There's so many things going on there as a black woman. It's particularly troubling the things that are happening there. And there's so much blame to be thrown around for everything. But if you can't support mothers to take care of their children, who's taking care of the children? Someone still has to. Yeah. It's such a weird system of of not supporting people. It, it's been really hard to digest and and really hurtful to see. You know, like just to see the level of how it affects people day to day. And I think also one of the things we got to talk about on the trip was gender transitioning and how hard that is. And and that fits in with hormones, right? Like the hormones have a huge effect. We know that. But just the lack of support when you actually get the thing that you were trying to get to. We talked to Trevor McDonald, who is um, actually lives in Canada too, and he's a trans man and chest fed his kids, two children, and you know spoke to us about his experience. And it, it just sounded like it's just something that we really need to be paying attention to and supporting people with. And there were many different states where, where you know, that was hard because of visibility and because of support and because of you know all those things and, and just like in general the community's support and kind of understanding of of those needs too. So yeah. And of course, like there is so much happening for the black community right now in terms of like all this violence and like, you know, I just really feel like we need to be coming together and and supporting people and like, you know, watching out for each other and giving each other love, you know, as much as we can, because that's like, that's the opposite of that. And we just, we need to show, you know, I, I kind of sometimes have this image of like, if we all were showing love to each other as much as we could, then it would really show up if you weren't doing that. Like you would really stand out if you were just deciding to still be like really violent and really awful. So I think that that's something that I hope to kind of keep spreading to with this mission. Mm -hmm. Like making love the norm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the things that, that you mentioned as well was just when you go into the communities and you're giving your talks and you start by being inclusive and also being non-judgmental, but putting the power back into the hands of the women. Mm-hmm. And I think that that's really important. I find as well, similarly in my work with clients, I think that everybody, you know, even probably us are used to going to the doctor and the whole kind of modality there is you go to the doctor and the doctor, you know, you, you present your problem and within two minutes, the doctor then provides you with the solution. And it's very like top down directed, like you need to do this. This is what you need to take. You need to go away and do it. If you have any questions, you 
become kind of a problematic patient. And then if you don't comply with what the doctor is saying, because maybe it doesn't sit right with you, or maybe you have concerns, you are again, a bad patient. Mm -hmm. So I think that when then you're non-compliant, absolutely. Like it's a thing. And then you could like, and, and, oh, that's a whole other topic of parents and people being like forcibly made to take medications and things like that, if they're not complying. But I feel like then when you're working with clients through this paradigm, it can be kind of refreshing, but also just really different to be working with someone who says, you know what, I'm going to make these suggestions for you. This is why these things could help you. But ultimately, the decision is yours. And I suggest that you do a little bit of research and sit with it for a bit and see how you feel about these things. I mean, I feel like people are kind of like they think they feel like they're on Mars because this is totally different experience. Yeah, yeah, I think that can be sort of scary for people too. It's it's a lot of responsibility to take on, and when we're sort of used to being told what's best for our bodies, then it can be both jarring and empowering. But I really like in in the beginning of the lifestyle um, discussion, Emily talks about your community and how your medical doctor is just one resource but you can have many other resources, including, you know, like a fertility awareness coach, um, including yourself. You're the biggest resource of your body's information. Yeah, absolutely. And kind of remembering, I had this moment when I was pregnant with my first son and I chose midwives and I'm really fortunate to live in Ontario and to have access to midwives and it's covered by healthcare. So I'm very fortunate to have these types of options Mm -hmm. because even just a few years ago, midwifery wasn't covered. And when I I lived in Alberta, different province, and Mm -hmm. it's probably covered now, but, you know, years ago wasn't. So you kind of knew that you would have to pay out of pocket for these things. So, you know, these things have been changing. But anyway, so I'm sitting there and, you know, she's doing, I think it was probably in our intro kind of consultation, which was an hour. (laughs) And I'm saying that because, of course, when you go to the doctor, it's often five, yeah. 10 minutes. Right. <laughs> but in that consultation, she was talking to me just in general. And she kind of mentioned, she says, you know, these are all different options that you can do or whatever. And she said something that kind of surprised me at the time when she said that, you know, you don't even ultrasounds are optional. And she mm, kind yes. of reminded me of my kind of right. I feel like we get trapped in this paradigm where we believe that if the doctor says, go get this blood test, that you actually have to. And I'm not saying don't get the blood test, but I'm saying no, that you have the choice. You have the option to say, yes, I want the blood test or no, I don't. You have the option to say, yes, I want the medication or no, I don't. It doesn't mean that there aren't consequences. It doesn't mean that you don't need to educate yourself if you're going to choose to make those decisions. But ultimately, we have to be reminded that the Mm -hmm. decisions are ours. And when you do get the blood test, you have to be reminded that it's your information and you can ask the doctor for a copy. Yeah, that was, we met this woman. Um, her name is Kristen Pascucci. That's probably a wrong pronunciation. And we stayed with her for her birthday, actually in Lexington, Kentucky. And she does this thing called yeah, improving birth. And she basically just does these workshops on teaching people what their rights are and advocating for themselves. And she, the stuff she told us, I was like, how do we not know this? And, and what she does too, is she works with a few friends together and they basically help people who have had, who've been basically had obstetrical violence and they help them take their case. So, you know, this woman who just had like a a forced, like non, non non-consensual episiotomy, she won her case, right? She won her case. And just the fact that her case was even taken, like took so much work. And Kristen was like putting that video out there and like helping it gain momentum. And just the fact that that we know people in this birth arena that are just dedicating themselves to that visibility of the fact that you have rights with your body, like human rights with your body when you're giving birth, which is a natural state of your body (laughs) when you're pregnant, which is a natural state of your body is just amazing to me. So that was another thing that we learned on the trip was just like, she went through all this stuff with us and you know, just like what consent actually means and what this piece of paper actually means and how much stuff in the hospital you don't actually have to do. And, and I thought I knew a lot and I was just like, everyone needs to talk to you. We're actually going to have her as a guest on our podcast soon. So that's going to be really good and definitely look out for that. Yeah, that's so important. I've, I mean, I've, I've read some horror stories. I, I mean, I can't even begin to just understand some of the trauma that women have gone through in, in, in birth. And it's the reality, I think, to some degree is, I mean, you can say 
and understand and recognize that you have rights, specifically in the birth arena. But, uh, you know, as we touched on already, if you don't go ahead and kind of go along with it, then you are a bad patient. And so it's really hard because, you know, most women are not doctors. And that means that you don't really like fully 100% know all of the kind of risks involved in those types of things. And so then it's, it's a lot of pressure. If you are in labor and, you know, the doctor comes in and tells you that, you know, your, your baby's struggling and, and you need to have, you know, you need to have this procedure or else, cause it, it's really like your baby's life is on the line. So yep. it's really hard to make informed decisions at that point because it's not like you have time to like Google it. Well, that's Definitely. when people get there first. <laughs> Kelsey will talk, can talk a little bit about it maybe. Yeah, I was just going to say there is some fear mongering sometimes and it's such, you're in such a vulnerable place and sometimes you know, all of your options aren't presented to you. And that's why, you know, we, we hope to, to meet with more middle schoolers and more teenagers and, and start to talk about having that voice a lot earlier so that later on, you know, hopefully we can be more comfortable asking those questions and kind of acting out our rights when, when we need to. And it, it's just a way of presenting the care and your role in your care, right? So we wanted to kind of get there earlier than birth um, because then there's, there's this other person, there's this baby or babies that are involved. And then that kind of creates a different emotional layer, right? But if we are teaching or like empowering younger people to have this like advocacy voice for themselves or just to understand like, oh, well, I'm the authority on my body. And then my doctor's there with some information. And so is my nutritionist. And so is my herbalist. And so is my fertility awareness educator. And then I bring it all back to me and I make the decisions. Okay, that's great. You know, if we have more of that attitude earlier on, if we're able to kind of like help people to reach that place, if they if that's where they feel comfortable earlier on, then I feel like some of that stuff will be a little bit different for them. And that's our hope. And that was also one of the sort of like motivations to do this was that we saw this happening. And I was like, well, we got to start way earlier than when somebody's pregnant. Yeah, no, absolutely. And the reason that I kind of bring up that example to be the Debbie Downer in the conversation is that if you choose to do things your own way, if you choose to do your own research, and so you do your own research and you watch Ricky Lake's documentary, The Business of Being Born, and you run out and buy, there's this great book called Misconceptions that paints a really scary picture of just the overuse of C-sections in the United States Mm -hmm. for women who don't need them, you know, statistically speaking, Mm -hmm. and then also for different reasons. So, I mean, there's obviously situations where women need to have certain procedures, but there are also obviously situations where women are offered these procedures when they're not 100% medically necessary. So if you decide to do your own research and, you know, you want to have your birth your own way, you you don't want to do certain things during your pregnancy, you don't want certain procedures, don't think it's going to be easy because it's Mm -hmm. not always easy. Some women, you know, have a really easy experience like, oh, I just want to do a home birth and all my friends were supportive and my, my partner was super supportive and everything was great. And other women don't end up getting the experience that they want and they don't find that support. And so, yeah, so it's, it's, it's really important to know that you have these options, but I think it's also important to know that when you choose to kind of be the black sheep, no pun intended, um, (laughs) sometimes it's hard. Yeah, no, it really, it really can be. And, and that's where sort of like eliminating or or addressing, you know, one of the things right now is that we're bringing a lot of stuff out into the light. Like we're shining, we're, we're really just like dragging out all of this like super scary negative stuff at the moment and looking at it. And I'm like, let's just throw this in there too. Like, why not? Let's just get it all out there and look at it. Cause we need to, we, we absolutely have to change in a really radical way as like as humans and as a society. So I think, yeah, just like eliminating some of that fear so that that isn't in the, in your community when you're when you're like I want to do a home birth and you're not being met by all this because it's just fear it's just like and what that really is is just lack of information and and lack of like you know just having those facts and it's all like conditioning so if we're able to kind of address that with education too I think that we put ourselves in a much easier place hopefully no absolutely 
So as we get towards the end of our interview today, before I go into my final questions, I just wanted to ask you, you know, you traveled all across the U.S. You spoke to hundreds, if not thousands of, of women and men on your journey. What is the most important takeaway that you want to give women who are listening to this podcast today? I would say probably the same takeaway we hoped people got from our classes, which was that, you know, your body has worth. We think that that's not being said enough and that, you know, advertisements and the media in general is telling us that, that we're not enough. And, and so we always want, just wanted people to feel like they're enough, that your body has worth, that you, you can always keep asking for more. And we're always here as a resource if anyone has any questions or, yeah. And I want to dive into that more. So my body has worth. What does that mean? So Mm -hmm. how does me knowing that change my life at all? I think that if I had felt that my body was worth a little bit more, I would have pushed for a little bit more comfort during my cycle. I would have pushed to know a little bit more. But a lot of times through our actions as providers, as educators, or just as people within society, I think that we subconsciously tell especially women, but I think everybody that their bodies are not worth anything, you know, in the way that we're like, you know, like rape culture that tells us that our bodies aren't worth anything. Obstetrical violence, the way that we expect people's bodies to have to be managed during a natural process that our bodies have been doing for like so many (laughs) hundreds of thousands of years. I think that that really is, I mean, it's very boiled down just saying your body has worth, but I think that's where we make it sort of like accessible and, um, and meaningful to everybody in a wider population is boiling it down. But really what it means is, is kind of the opposite of all of those times when you are given a no, when your body's capacity and natural, like amazing abilities are undermined. And when, um, and when you're told that your experience isn't worth anything, when you're told that, well, you're on birth control and it's stopping you from having a libido or you're feeling really anxious and depressed, but that's your qualitative experience. And that's not worth anything, you know, like just you as a person are just worth so much. And specifically like really putting that to the body too, because I think that we don't really value people's experiences in their body and how they live in their body. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, it sounds like you're kind of drilling in there. You know, you have the right to live comfortably uh, mm-hmm. without mm-hmm. an expectation of, you know, excruciating pain on a regular basis. Mm-hmm. You have the right to choose what's done to you. Yeah. And not just be, just, not just surrender to mm-hmm. whatever it is that someone wants to do to your body. I think I think it's really just interesting and horrible that there are doctors out there and obstetricians out there that will just give a woman an episiotomy without telling like that kind of stuff. So yes, I I understand what you're saying now. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. So final questions of the day, what would you say is the biggest myth about fertility that you'd like to see corrected? I need people to talk about the cervix way more, cervical fluid. I think just like what its role is. We talk about sperm. Like, I think we're almost allowed to talk about sperm, like in a joking way, in like a serious way. It's just like out there. Everybody talks about it. It's like, that's a symbol of fertility. That's what babies are made from. But we don't really talk about cervical fluid. We don't talk about how it changes. We don't talk about how you only have this like one period of fertility, how the rest of the time you're not fertile and and it's not possible to conceive. We don't talk about, and I think that talking about it changing is really important because any other time that we talk about changing in the body, it's pathological. And then there's this one thing that nobody really gets explained and then it shows up in your underwear and you're supposed to understand that it's going to be different sometimes and that that's not an infection. And you're supposed to understand what that means and you're supposed to be able to link that back to fertility. I think one of the things we say a lot is like, meet your cervix. Um, And we're kind of joking, but we're also not, you know, we're also like, meet your cervix so that you don't have to meet it in labor because there's a lot going on at that time. Mm -hmm. And you're saying this to many women who've probably never even seen their own vulva. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the vulva, if anyone's like, what the heck is a vulva, is if you were to put a mirror in between your legs and what's smiling back at you is your vulva, all of the Mm -hmm. external genitalia. I always have to throw in my little biology lesson there. Yeah. Thank you. Also, if you're at the doctor or the midwife, you can always ask them to bring a mirror into the exam room if they're doing um, like a speculum exam and you you can ask them to to help you see your cervix. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, yeah. And again, that's probably something that you didn't know you could do. And hopefully your 
care provider is open to that. But hey, I would, there are women who buy their own speculums just to yeah, see their own cervixes. Have, have <laughs> yes. and, and just to go back to the vulva, we, we talk about that too, that we, we, many people were angry when they realized that they had been calling their vulva a vagina and they had been misnaming their, their body parts. And so we actually do have a shirt that has a vulva on it. We have a shirt that has a, a phenotypically female reproductive system on it. And we have a shirt that has a vulva on it. And those are like what we were wearing when we were talking and then we sold them. So there are many people, we just hope to change that imagery, like let people see vulvas out in the world because, you know, pretty much every bathroom wall probably has like a penis drawn on it. So can we just draw some vulvas, please? <laughs> I just thought of a really funny story and I just have to share it because it's, I think it was just awesome. So when I was in university, I volunteered for the Women's Center sometimes on campus and they did this awareness campaign a couple of times. And so someone would bake cookies and they were vulva cookies. So they were actually in the shape of the vulva and then the clitoris had one of those little, you know, metal balls, those edible little things. So the clitoris yeah, yeah. would really stand out. And I'll, honestly, it was like the the funnest, most hilarious thing to be part of. So what would happen is, you know, not everyone would be open to it. You're offering free cookies. And so some people are like sweet and some people aren't. But what would happen is you get these guys that would come because you say free cookies and they would uh, take the cookie, not realizing that it was a vulva and then walk away. <laughs> And then they would look at it and look back at you and smile and some of them would smell it. It was like, (laughs) it was the funniest thing ever. I haven't thought about that in so long. So thank you for bringing back that fun memory for me. Yeah, of course. (laughs) We actually have rings made by our friend. Um, His company is called Penelope Jones and they're the anatomical clitoris. Um, which apparently wasn't discovered by the medical community until 1998. And we had all these <laughs> people in our classes be like, I knew about it way before 1998. Because oh <laughs> it's goodness. a lot bigger than some people might think. It's kind of what's on the outside is sort of the tip of the iceberg. Several so, inches yeah. deep in there. The clitoris yeah. is is huge and it becomes erect. It fills with blood similar to the penis. And yeah, it's the clitoris is like a beast. It's this amazing, um, because it's huge. uh, Yeah, I digress. I digress. (laughs) Okay. There's some amazing stuff out there on on all this stuff. I was just thinking of this mom who um, responded to somebody on Twitter who wrote something negative about a period and she responded because she's a mom and she, she has a daughter and she responded with this like amazing poem and one of the lines is my own cervix is mad influential everybody I love knows how to bleed with me and it was just like oh oh my god this mother but you have to you have to watch it it's this poem it's like I'll send it to you it's on YouTube but yeah I just think it's so great to see people like coming out and just talking about their bodies and and defending their right to be here and live in this body I think it's awesome Mm -hmm. Well, this is making me think that I should do a whole other show like Ode to Vaginas, Vulvas, Clitoris and Cervix because that's actually not something I've gotten into a ton on the show. And I apparently have a lot to say about it because I just have a thousand things (laughs) flowing through my mind. So, uh, well, yeah, I'll have to look into doing a show on that. But last question of the day, I guess I'm trying to think of something now because I usually ask the same questions. But I mean, what's something about fertility awareness that you would want the listeners to know? I think that it doesn't have to be for having a baby or for Mm. not having a baby. It can be for your health. Like it's a barometer, your your menstrual cycle is a barometer of health. And I think think many people associate it because of the word fertility, of course, with with like trying for a baby or somebody who's using it as birth control. And I think that I just want to add that it's for everyone. You can define it. You can do it in the way that you want to do it. And that really the only person who it needs to be concerned with is you in your body your relationship, your body, your vulva, your business. That's really what I think is the message. It's just like you get to define it Mm, (laughs) Um, because I think that there are a lot of – in the same way that there are misconceptions about things in the medical community that can be disempowering, I think some of the things that are emerging that are maybe more sort of um, alternative to that system can also be – there can be misconceptions that can can be barriers to people getting those services or using those services. So I think that's something I like to tell people is that the first person that it concerns is you and you don't even need to take it further than that. Mm -hmm. I think those are amazing words to end on. 
Kelsey and Emily, thank you so much for coming on the show today. I had so much fun talking with you. Thank you. Thank you. We're so excited. We listened to your podcast during our road trip. <laughs> so much. So awesome. Yeah. Well, I was glad I could be there with you guys. Yeah, thanks for coming on the trip. <laughs> no problem. Anytime. Well, we've talked a little bit about your website. But why don't you tell our listeners again how they can find you and the work that you're doing? So we're on Facebook, just The Fifth Vital Sign. We're also on Instagram, The Fifth Vital Sign. That's all letters. And then our website is 5thvitalsign.com. And our e- email is the fifth vital sign, all letters at gmail.com. And our home addresses. <laughs> <laughs> and my birth weight and yeah. my blood type <laughs> oh negative if anyone needs blood you know yeah. I mean? excellent we need to i'll put all of that information on the show notes page no, just kidding. but yes but you can find all the links on the show notes page so you don't have to worry about that if you're listening on the go but i just want to thank you again it was so much fun connecting with you and i really think it's just amazing and very inspiring that you just like Let's just drive across the country and educate about female reproductive health and fertility awareness. And so I just, I love that. I love that energy and I can't wait to see what you do next. (laughs) Thank you. Yeah. I think that was a huge inspiration for some people too. Just like two normal people deciding to do something that we had jumped about and doing it. Yeah. Yeah. Because most people think about these cool things and then they just kind of roll over and turn on the TV and start feeling sad because that's what the TV, that's how the TV TV. makes you feel. TV (laughs) makes you feel sad. Yeah. Yeah, We read a quote the other day that was like, I kept thinking someone should do something about this. And then I realized that I'm someone. Yeah. That was totally a thing. We, We were like, wait, like, I can, what, like sometimes when you're called to do something, you're like, why me? And we were just like, why not us? Why yeah. not us? Oh, yes. There's just too much good stuff here. I'll just have to have you guys on again. But thank you so <laughs> much. <laughs> thank you thank so you. much for coming on the show. Bye, thank you for listening. I found today's episode to be so inspiring. I love that Kelsey and Emily just picked up and decided to travel across the country and <laughs> and just educate women about their menstrual cycle health and all of the things that I always hear. I get so many emails every week from women saying that I wish I knew this when I was in junior high. Why didn't someone teach this? And I really believe that it's just going to take scrappy women like me, like Kelsey and Emily, who are just like, you know what, I'm just going to start educating women to really get the word out there. And so I'm just so inspired after doing my interview with Kelsey and Emily because of their just get up and go, just no excuses, not a whole lot of thinking and wondering and worrying if it's not going to work out, just getting out there and really getting the information for women. And so I'm excited to see what they do next. (laughs) So if you enjoyed today's episode, please share with a friend who you think will benefit from it. You'll find the show notes page for today's episode at fertilityfriday.com slash 91. If you've been enjoying the podcast, please look for it on iTunes and leave a five-star review so that more people can find it. And make sure to head over to fertilityfriday.com and join my email list. If you have an idea for a podcast episode or a guest suggestion, send me an email at info at fertilityfriday.com. And for a list of all the episodes that I've recorded thus far, you can go to fertilityfriday.com slash episodes where... I have a list of every single episode that I've ever done and also makes it easier to find if you're looking for a particular one. So thank you for hanging out with me today. I appreciate all of you for taking the time to tune into the podcast, whether you're on the go or commuting to work. So thanks again for hanging out with me. And as always, until next time, be well and happy charting.